Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of these live streams for Light and Land. Hopefully, we're broadcasting and you can uh, hear us and see us loud and clear. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with Margaret. So, Margaret, hello. Hello, nice to be here as well. Uh, we were just commenting that the wonders of technology, we are hundreds of miles apart, even though we're both born and bred in the same part of the world. <laughs> and now we're hundreds of miles apart, and there's plenty of you. Uh, people out there watching so do let us know as per usual uh, if you can uh, you know drop us a comment uh, let us know where you are in the world it's a great thrill to see that we've had people in South Africa in Australia in America all sorts of places so it's really cool for us to know uh, where you are and where you're watching from and forgive me while I multitask I'm, I'm doubly hoping my hay fever doesn't go crazy tonight as well <laughs> but let's get to it uh, tonight uh, we've got Margaret with us and carrying on our tours and trips, uh, we're now heading to Scotland and all of these um, live streams that we've had are going to be slightly different because everybody's got their own personalities and our goal is to try and share those and so you get to know some of our tour leaders along with some of the locations and that will involve talking about the background, the motivations and everything else. So uh, that's probably enough from me but Margaret I, if I can start with obviously a lot of us choose our tours because they're places that we really love and that we know intimately uh, and so I can you give us a little bit of background about your relationship with the the highlands of Scotland and all around the area? Yeah sure so basically I live in the highlands of Scotland and um, I live so I live in Drummond Drockett and as uh, Sam mentioned earlier I'm actually originally from Manchester so um, I can, obviously a completely, complete contrast to where I live now. And I suppose what I wanted to do was to share, just to share my story as to how I ended up here. <laughs> and um, just to give you a little bit of a feel for the Highlands of Scotland in general and, and what, what it is that I've come to, to love about it so much. And um, so obviously I grew up in Manchester in, in Chalton, so quite, quite in the heart, at heart of uh, uh, the, almost the city itself. So it was quite a... Uh, a different upbringing to where I'm living now and I you know I'd always had a, a fascination for like quieter places and the coastal areas ever since I was really really young so I'd kind of had short periods of like trying out living in Wales and Cornwall um, and mostly just because I love surfing as well so I, I ended up going to those places and then when I was um, 21 I was going to university and I had this little bit gap of time and I, I was just looked at a map and this was in the days before we had, uh, did we have internet back then? I don't, I don't think we did really. <laughs> and, oh, <no. laughs> and so I had a, a book that, that gave you summer jobs you could go to um, in, in the UK. And I saw this place in the t north of Scotland and called Dundonald. And I thought, oh, you know what, that, that looks amazing. It looks like these, these amazing small roads and it looks uninhabited and like a completely different land that I want to see. So I took the job there and I was... Um, I just packed up the car and I did a, I did a like a, a, a map thing and it wasn't sat nav at the time again, but it, it came up as it being about an eight hour drive from home. So I set off early and you know, that the, there's some things that stay with you in your memory for all these years. And, and the one thing for me was that drive from Manchester to somewhere that I didn't know existed before, um, before that, I didn't think any place like this existed. And, you know, I was driving for hours and hours and, when you drive up up here, I, probably a lot of you will know this, but you, when you get towards um, towards Ullapool, the road gets smaller and smaller, and it's just wilder and wilder and more remote. And it started it started to feel like, where am I? You know, this is absolutely beautiful land, and there's, but there was nothing there, and there weren't many cars because it was April, so it was starting to get colder as well and windier and a little bit of snow and some stags were appearing. It was getting quite bizarre. And then, and then you turn off onto the road, it's called um, Destitution Road, which is the road that goes over to Dundonnell itself. Um, I'd be interested to, if anybody knows this, this, this way actually, because you'll probably understand what I'm talking about. And I think at this point I started to think that I was never going to get there or I was completely lost and I was entering this place. That nobody would rescue me. But anyway, I did. After half an hour on, on Destitution Road, I ended up in Dundonald. And I just, that moment, I, I can never forget, you know, there was, there was wind and there was, it just had this really amazing, um, I can only describe it as, as raw highlands, I guess, you know, and there was those 
Dundonald sits at the foot of Anchelach, which is one of the, the, the mountains, and it's on the shore of Loch Broom as well. So you're just looking down the, the loch and the mountains are rising there, and it was just incredible. And I think, you know, I'd never been further from home, but I, I just felt instantly um, in love with this place. So that was my um, first time in the Highlands. And, you know, I haven't ever, I didn't ever stop going back. I went to university, I kept, kept going back. And eventually I moved to, to Dundonald and I spent a couple of years living there, um, which was just, just incredible. Um, and then I then moved on from there to Ullapool and I spent 10 years in Ullapool. Um, so, you know, I spent a lot of my life living in, in the Highlands and um, it's like, um, it's like a, a wonderful wilderness with deer and cattle and water and, and just amazing coastline and it's a it's a fantastic place that you can never really get bored of well I couldn't anyway but then I don't really like shopping or anything like that so I'm quite happy up there um, so after after Wallapool I, I moved over to Drogna Drocket which is where I live now and one of the actual the picture on the screen just now is an image that's just not far from my home and so I, I have a real, obviously I have a real love of the Highlands. I, it, it, it's, it's been my home now for 25 years and um, I, I can't think of a better place to be. I've, I spent um, about five years at, at one point doing travel photography and I was going to different places in the world for, for um, newspapers and, and companies and you know it started to feel like why why am I doing this I actually stopped eventually it started to feel like why am I doing this because Scotland feels right to me Scotland feels like it's got so many opportunities and um, uh, hopefully we'll just um, um, tell you all today and show you all today exactly how many opportunities it has and so yeah you can obviously tell I'm quite passionate about Scotland <laughs> <laughs> no it's great and I mean like I said it's it's fantastic that we can get uh, tutors and leaders going to the places that they know and they love because it really can help the uh, guests you know really get into it and learn a bit more about it and um, goes past just the photography doesn't it and that's probably a theme that we're probably going to talk about more more and more um yeah. so in terms of just um laying it out for people and obviously welcome uh, lots of people joining us now online let us know where you're from it's fantastic we've got people in scotland uh, in <laughs> ireland in in just outside Dorchester that's not me um <laughs> and the Black Isle again Lake District so it's fab Italy Holland Somerset it's great Frankfurt let us know where you are mm -hmm. and throughout the evening if there are questions we're absolutely happy to pass those on to Margaret be it about the locations be it about the photography of these images and or general photographic motivation inspiration whatever questions they might be so do let us know and welcome to the chat, uh, the, the lady from Wisconsin who's just joined us. Anyway, mm -hmm. Margaret, the point of yes. this evening was we were picking some of the uh, locks and some of the locations that you cover in the tour, which is at the end of October for Light and Land yeah. uh, that you do. So um, you've talked a bit about the coastline, but there's a different vibe, isn't there, within within the, the locks and, and how, um, you know, how you represent those in the images. So should we walk through a couple here at the beginning and we can get into that a little bit more? yeah sure yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, this I th is i think i think the thing about uh, the sorry the thing about the highlands of scotland is it's it's the you know it's the largest region of scotland um but it's also the most sparsely populated so uh, in fact it's the most sparsely populated in europe <laughs> so which is quite interesting and it's also got just a little fact for you it's got thirty one thousand lochs so th there's a lot of um most uh, there's something like 350 that are large lochs but then the rest of them, there's, there's literally locks everywhere. So, you know, you sort of drive around the corner and find a, a lock or a lock, as you, as you call them. Um, so, you know, there's, there is water everywhere. So when, when I put this together, when I wanted to do a tour, um, I've picked some of the main locks that sort of led us on a journey through Scotland on the, on the locks. That are, some of the amazing locks, I think, are wonderful. Um, but there's also lots of other ones so you know there's, there's ample opportunity for various loss depending on on the weather yeah and we, that's it we can only pick a certain amount of things to go through today but hopefully it gives you kind of a representation of some of the um scenes and some of the atmosphere because i think that's a big thing is an atmosphere and how we connect yeah. to that atmosphere as well and obviously the image here we've got on screen is a is a is a wintry image because mm -hmm. of the snow and you do get all seasons up there don't you really in full 
You do indeed, yes. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting place because, yes, you do get a lot of different types of weather coming through. Obviously, we're not, in October, we're probably not going to get snow. <laughs> but this is, I, I actually wanted to share this one because it's one of, the, one of my favourite locations at the bottom of Loch Ness. Um, and it's just beautiful the way the trees frame the, the loch and um, it's possible to get right down to the water's edge there. So um, I, I, just, I just love this image because of its... Um, because the way that the trees are, are just lining it and the snow obviously is, is helping a little bit with this one. Um, but the weather is certainly unpredictable, <laughs> but, but that always makes for fabulous landscape images. For me, it does anyway. I, I sort of feel the more um, changeable the weather, um, the better for me. Yeah, absolutely. And whenever you get that deep, dark, inky, bluey grey up yeah. the top with, with the white of the snow as well, it's a fab combination to yeah. play with, isn't yeah. it? Um, so let's move just if we can briefly into our first sort of area as it were and we've, we've picked out some images from the Glen Affric area um, and again a little bit specific to the time of year so Margaret if you can just give us a little bit of a set the scene for those of us that are dotted around the world here about Glen Affric and then maybe we can talk about how um, someone might go about creating some sort of unique imagery for themselves or the process you might have of shooting in those areas as well. Yeah, sure. So Glen Affric is, oh, it's absolutely fantastic area. I'm sure quite a few people know, know the area. It's, um, it's, it's just an amazing Glen. It's roughly uh, maybe 40 minutes from where we'd be staying in, in Loch Ness. Um, so it's a, it's a Glen with a, a, a big, lots of rivers that lead down to it. There's mountains, there's, there's also woodland areas, so you can see in the next few images the woodland areas are like really what make it in the in this time of year. So in October we have some fantastic um, the light at that time of year. If you get the light and the colours in Glen Affric, it's um, it's just an incredible combination. And then there's the water as well. So we've got all aspects in the one place. Um, so I, Glen Affric is just it's just stunning, and it's it's got this these beautiful forests, these, these colours, which are, are just amazing. But, and I think, you know, it's, it's, um, it's somewhere that you can, you could go off and create your own, you know, if you've got your own vision and your own thing that you want to photograph, there's so many opportunities. So it's not just the water, it's the trees or whatever it is that you respond to. There's plenty of opportunity there. It's a fantastic place. And at this time of year as well, that beautiful light, it's never mm. too harsh from above, isn't it? There's plenty of low Wonderful. light. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like you don't have to get up for three o'clock in the morning for the, <laughs> <laughs> like you do at the moment. Yeah. So you get you get amazing light as well. And, you know, it's not always guaranteed the sunshine, but when it happens and it often does um, the last week in October, first week in November, it tends to be a, a, a really beautiful time of year. here. It's probably one of my favorite times of year. So. So I'd wanted to just actually, and we'll pick up on a couple of the images as we go in, in more detail if, if we wish to. Obviously, this um, is a great example of using the water um, successfully. Well, successfully, you know what I mean, uh, yeah. to, to, to have another interest along with the woodland as well. And it's not always that you get the two together. Uh, and often it can be just woodland, which can be difficult in its own way or water, which yeah. can be difficult in its own way. So, um, you know, what what sort of things do you seek in these scenes in terms of you know we could be anywhere here couldn't we yes. uh, but but yeah. the location is not unimportant the location is motivating some of your yeah. vision and some of yeah. your feeling isn't it can yeah. you sort of elaborate on that a little bit yeah it's a funny one that isn't it and I think that a lot a lot of the images that I create are not particularly um related to the or to the the actual location and I think that's in, in some ways I often choose places that aren't quite so well known um, because it it frees you up almost from those preconceptions so um, if you were to go to a really well-known mountain for example that's been photographed many many times and um, you have these concepts of what you should have what you should create or what somebody else has created and I think that it becomes quite freeing to go to a place that's not being represented so much because you don't have any you don't have any of those visions in your head already I don't know if you noticed it's really hard to get rid of a, a vision of a place that's been photographed a lot it's very very difficult when you've seen images of it to to get rid of that and do your own your own um, interpretation of a scene and so I think that when we go to places that are a little bit um, slightly different and um, it, it just it helps almost it helps people be able to be more authentic and create their own image 
uh, it certainly does for me and often I, I, mean, I know myself when I when I photograph water or um, anything like this I often um, it, it could be anywhere actually you know and I don't I don't think that's a problem as long as you're you're creating something that's um, according to your vision to the vision that you have and I think it's a response to your own um, your own self you know it becomes very personal then does that does that make any sense <laughs> yeah no yeah. no absolutely but I, I think it's something maybe people um, struggle with sometimes mm -hmm. it's because we're we whisk between places sometimes yeah. and there's a especially if you're away on a tour or with friends even and you've spent money to get there and there's uh, sometimes as landscape photographers we we have a um you know a hope about weather all the time but then there's always a need yeah. to be flexible yes. and, and find a vision within yeah. what you have so i suppose when you're in these sorts of locations with water i think is a great place to always find something and i know you love yes. the coast like i love the coast yeah. uh, so do you find that if maybe if guests or if any if you're out with others you know do you find there's particular things they struggle with maybe you know there's so much going on do they do people yeah. sometimes find it hard to zone in a little yeah definitely i i i often um think that people get to a particular location and it's a bit overwhelming so you've got something in front of you that you really want to capture and it's like this real kind of desire to um take a successful image of this and a successful image of that and it becomes overwhelming and then you put in, you become to put pressure on yourself um, so I think that if you can take away that pressure and look away from that scene and, and just have a look around and to do um, something that's slightly different, I think a, a, a big scene sometimes overwhelms people. So I always encourage people to hone in on some of the details and do something slightly different. And it sometimes just frees you from that um, need to photograph that scene as such in a successful way because to be honest with you it's not everybody's not always everybody's um thing to do a, a traditional style landscape you know a lot of people respond better to uh, say details or colors and shapes i mean here we're looking at basically we're looking at colors and shapes and patterns there you know that's um and it's a different way of photographing and it kind of frees you from what you think is expected of a landscape photographer so I guess it's kind of a bit like when I when I started doing landscape photography years ago, I always thought that landscape photographers had to climb mountains and take pictures from the top of mountains. I don't know why, but I did, and and I and you know I tried it, and it was just it just didn't work. It didn't work for me. You know, it just wasn't um, it wasn't true to me. Um, so it took me a long time to realize actually that's not I didn't have to do that you know like to, to be a landscape photographer what I had to do was listen to myself and do something that was really authentic to, to, to me so I think if we can teach people to to hear that and to respond to that um, the, the true self part and for them to become more self-aware it's it's a, a process a way of the way of doing that is to show them that you don't have to photograph the scene that's put in front of you and to just go and have a look and see what, what what's calling you yeah absolutely and there's lots to pick up on that but i i, <laughs> I think um i think the the point about you know even color as a compositional element yeah. you know which is very much what you've you've been using here um and really what is in theory quite busy is really quite mm -hmm. um is constructed just two or three things, which is the color of the, of the gold yeah. and orange, the color of the green and, and the water as well. So even in scenes which can feel overwhelmingly yeah. busy, it's yeah. finding that order within them, isn't it? If, if that's right. indeed that's the calming, yeah. constructed, you know, yeah. sense you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And for me, it's always about calm, and it's always about quietness and, and calmness. That's um, that's how I always approach photography, and uh, whether it's. A, a, and the reason that I always shoot water, I always shoot water a lot, is that um, water for me is very calming to me. So um, the coast and lochs are really, really important to me. So I've, I've always, um, I've always had a real love of the coast and I swim, I swim and surf and, you know, everything I do is water based. Everything, every, my whole life is somebody once used to call me a fish <laughs> i don't know whether that was a compliment or, <laughs> or not but um you know i would live in water if i could so for me water is my thing and i respond to that because it makes me feel very calm yeah. and so the images hopefully are very calming as a result so it, it's um it's just something that i respond to and i think that what i feel really really passionate about is 
teaching other people to find the thing that does it for them and for them not to um, worry so much about what everybody else is thinking or doing and to really find that that one one thing that really ignites a passion in them and then then they can start to create really amazing images for themselves that are, you know that are theirs and theirs only and I think that's one of the things that 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 really drives me actually it's a, a real desire to help people understand um, what it is that drives them because it's actually quite hard to find yourself <laughs> yeah no definitely and um as we as we walk through some of these as well this is um another uh from this from the same area and obviously different yeah. time of year but another great example of using space and and i suppose you know we we talk about that sense of calm there are visual things mm -hmm. that can aid that sense of calm aren't yeah. there yeah uh, yes. and in in this image uh, obviously colors and everything else so yeah. obviously this is a very uh beautifully surrounded area with mountains and so there's lots to work on here Yes, this is so. This is looking down into Glen Affric, and this was this was actually taken the day before lockdown. <laughs> so oh, wow. we just had some snow, and um, so it's actually the last picture I took um, for, for quite a while of, of water. Anyway, uh, it's, it's a lovely memory. But I think uh, you know when I talk about another thing is when you talk about memories and how you what you associate with um, the images become they become more powerful if, if the experience that you've you've had when you've taken that image is. Um, is is a positive one and uh, again i'm talking about calming so when i when i photograph i always feel completely peaceful completely immersed and it, you know it's it shows hopefully it shows in the images i think the experience is part of it yeah and i would imagine it's it's very quiet in these locations and you've got yes. time to just to relax into it because that makes a big difference doesn't it it does actually yeah and especially in october it's, it's very very quiet actually you know pretty much everyone's left by then so there's no there really isn't any rush for anything at all um and you know it, you, you're pretty much alone we're probably guaranteed to be alone on most of the locations um that we do in, in at the end of october which is just amazing isn't it it's it's a yeah. fantastic thing to be able to do and it gives you it just it just relaxes it's that whole thing about relaxing into the into the landscape and um just really being absorbed into it there's no other distractions yeah. There's, there's no other no other people <laughs> which is fantastic yeah i think we're both like a empty space like that i think just just from photographically i suppose just to pick up on something within the image obviously reflections and you know mm. synergy between shapes yeah. is, is something really to play with from the water isn't it it's a useful yeah. thing to play with absolutely and I'm, I, I i mean it's wonderful when you get conditions like this i have to say it doesn't always happen but you know this has got to be really low wind um, but when you get the reflections in the water, it's, it can be pretty incredible. It's a special day when that happens. Fingers crossed on the weather. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you for the comments and stuff coming in. Do let us know if there are any questions. I'm happy to obviously pick those out as we go. I'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Uh, we're just staying in the, the Loch Afric area, Glen Afric. And obviously, you know, we've talked a little bit about it. But uh, and again, at this time of year, it's a great time to just uh, play with the details and mm -hmm. um, get yeah. close up into things and do you find you can just spend time sort of drifting away at staring at one leaf for an hour or so? Oh <laughs> so. definitely it's that you know I think it, I think with the whole um, being at home for so long as well <laughs> as well it's I think I don't know about you it certainly taught me to slow down even more and this kind of this mindfulness that comes from shooting details like this is it's just it's just exacerbated when you when you're really really concentrating on one tiny bit of nature and you can get you can get you just get lost in it don't you and you really you really notice things so much more you know photography it, it's just wonderful to be totally immersed in it and if you you can do that very much very much so by looking at these tiny little things because you you've really got to look around and you you know you're trying to notice things that you wouldn't notice on an ordinary day so you wouldn't you'd normally just walk past this leaf but if you were looking for to, to do these this style of photography a, you learn quite a lot about the camera and the technicals and um but you also get into this flow that just it takes your mind away from everything else so any anxieties any worries um it, it, you just can get totally absorbed and i think this kind of in this intimate landscape details is really powerful for that it's it's just an amazing thing to do i, I absolutely love it i think it's um and I, I love teaching it as well because not everybody does the big wide landscape particularly 
Um, and there's so many beautiful things in nature. And, you know, once we start to notice them, it just you, you start to be a bit more um, grateful for, for the world and, and notice all these tiny bits of small beauty that's everywhere. So, yeah, it's something you can come out of not having realised you've spent an hour <laughs> trying to photograph a leaf. It's wonderful. No, no, definitely. And I think what's interesting about all these talks that we've done is that through, throughout all of them, the individual photographers are finding ways to uh, enrich their, I don't, and this sounds a little bit holy, holier than now, sorry, mm -hmm. but we're finding ways to enrich our lives generally through the art of photography. And yes. that might vary depending on the photographer. It might be because they're racing up and down a mountain or it might be because they're happy to, to sit and imbibe. So I suppose, um, do people struggle a little bit to, to switch off to really just zoning because I know mindfulness and this isn't a mindfulness it's live stream necessarily but I know it's something yeah. you practice and, and believe yeah. in so yeah. are there little practical things maybe for those that are watching today that we could help people just to kind of get into the zone a little bit on these scenes yeah I think I think one of the things that, that everybody struggles with is well it's I guess it comes from fear of failure so you know fear of not not creating that perfect image so you know we're we're kind of um rushing a little bit so we often sort of feel the need to photograph something that's going to be amazing um, and I think if you can take that away a little bit and, and take away that sort of perfectionism and just try and enjoy the process and when you start to relax and enjoy the process a little bit then it becomes um, it becomes more enjoyable and easier to slow down because you're not worrying about getting um, like getting five images today <laughs> you know it's that's not the point the point is to enjoying the process so I think we can do that we can all learn to do that and it's a, a simple way of doing that is to simply when you get out of the car or the van or whatever it is at the location just to stop and have a look around and just to feel like you've got you know you've got time we've got time you know you will create something and you know whatever it is that you create it's perfectly valid we all have we all have our own voice and our own our own uh, images inside of us and it, it will happen and not to worry and not to rush you know and I think that really helps with the with the mindset of, of um, not, not over worrying about creating something amazing and then you're more likely to create something amazing yeah as a net result <laughs> you are yeah yeah, that's, yeah no it's, it's good advice yeah keep the camera in the bag for the first yeah. hour at least yeah. is, is usually yeah. a good way to do it but yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to pick up on a question that's come in um yeah with uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one actually but with detailed shots uh, how do you work out slash manage where to crop uh, without losing too much detail but also keeping the key detail so I, I suppose it's yeah what how do you know when a, a closer up image like this is is working <laughs> visually because you know we know it you have to feel right but the, these things have yeah. to work visually still yeah so I mean I suppose when you when you're saying crop do you mean cr crop after after the actual yeah, I suppose, I suppose it, they may mean maybe, compose yeah. or crop after, yeah. Compose, yeah. I mean, I was one thing I was trying to do is get it get it in camera. I try not to do too much cropping. So, I I suppose with the detail images, what what I look for is something lovely and um, out of focus in the foreground. Because you, as you can see on this 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 image here, that leaf on the right hand side is out of focus, but it's because my lens is pretty much next to it, and so it's right right close in front of the lens. So that's what that's how I'm throwing out there, and then. And then I'm focusing on that leaf in the middle and then something how to focus in the background. So I think as long as you, if your eye is being led into the main part um, that you're focusing on, then we're halfway there to achieving something that's, that's pleasing. So it is, I, I understand what you're saying. It's quite difficult to know how close is close enough, but um, it's something I think that just when it looks um, pleasing and you've got something sharp that's, that's the main point of focus and something that's leading you into it, then um, it's a good start. Yeah, fab. Okay, well, hopefully that helps. That's the question. Thank you for the question. If there are any others, do yeah. keep them coming. I'll try and grab them as we go. Um, yeah. But, uh, Margaret, if we can just move location now slightly, if you can tell us yeah. where we are here. So we're in a, an, an unusual little lock, actually, and it's on the way back from uh, Glen Affric towards... Drumna Drockit. So it's in between Glen Affric and Loch Ness, basically. And this is just a, it's quite a nice loch that's, I don't think many people have ever photographed it because it's quite hard to access, actually. Um, so there's not many images that I've ever seen of it. It's called Loch Michli. 
and I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. <laughs> and it's a wonderful little loch because it's quite sheltered and it sits at the it sits at the bottom of the glen, so it often is completely covered in um, low cloud and mist, which is amazing. On this day, obviously, it was it was really really still, so it often gets um, nice low low winds as well. So it's a beautiful little loch, and I think I was just lucky that day. I was passing and. Um, there was just light hitting the, the snow on the on the, 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 the far shore there. So I was just quite close to the water at the at, down at the, the, the base of the loch and um, this took this image, which I, I, I really love actually. It's really peaceful. Yeah, it's um yeah. I, I really love this one as well. So yeah. I, that's why I wanted to hang on it for a minute. The just the perfection, the cleanliness, the crispness yeah. of that snow over there as well. And and yeah. really this darker top and bottom. So you know it's balance again isn't it and we talked about yes. that yeah. and a little bit with but going back to the question about the detail shot i suppose it's yeah. it's looking for that balance and it and is. those elements kind of matching up so i mean in theory this this shouldn't work yeah. <laughs> you, you could argue there's too much dark top and bottom but it, yeah. there's something about it that then what it helps you concentrate on the on the center i presume yeah and it's also yeah. right down the that you know compositionally it's right across the middle <laughs> so it shouldn't work no <laughs> but to, to me it to me it does and it, it feels quite feels quite peaceful and calm to me as well um so yeah and i think it was just i didn't do too much i don't do a huge amount of editing i probably did darken the, the bottom a little bit but um it was just the light that was happening that day so yeah Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Sorry, because a question just came in uh, before we move on. What, what's your, and again, this could be a long answer, but um, no, what, <laughs> what is your philosophy regarding getting it right in camera versus post-processing? So it's quite an easy philosophy, actually. It's, it's get it right in camera. <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically, I, um, I, I used to photograph a lot of weddings. And so I spent an extraordinary amount of time behind the computer screen doing Lightroom for, for you know, for a lot, a lot of images. And I, I love being outdoors. I love being in the landscape. I love shooting. I don't like sitting behind a computer screen particularly. So I got my, I've got my workflow down to a, a fine art and it, it, it's pretty quick, actually. I don't, it's just for me, I'm not saying this is right for everybody, whatever I say, it's, it's, this is just my opinion and how I work. Um, I don't do much editing at all to, to my images. Um, I'll do it fairly, fairly swift. In fact, I did some this morning and it took, it was about five seconds <laughs> of editing. So unless there's, you know, something that's um, dust spots maybe, which, which you know, need, needed pulled into a fed shop. Um, I, I tend to I work through Lightroom and um, yeah, fairly, 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 fairly swift, but that comes from a, a need to be out more and not behind a computer screen more. So it, that's a personal thing to me. Yeah, and I would imagine the years of doing wedding means you're pretty yeah. <laughs> nailing everything in, in the camera Absolutely. anyway. To Absolutely, be honest. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. So I wanted to take us to this uh, Loch Ness image. But, and I know, uh, as you mentioned at the, at the top, um, that you're, you live very nearby here. And obviously it's a, it's a place that has a, a, you know, even for a, a fellow Mancunian boy who's, who's not spent a huge amount of time in Scotland at all, we all know Loch Ness. And there's, there's such sort of mythology and all sorts of things around it um and we've got a few images so we'll just we'll walk through a few here but this is one i i know i when i see this i know it's you if that makes sense and i've said this on a couple of webinars we've been doing there are certain images that you just attach to people that you, you really yes. strongly think about their yeah. vibe because of it um yeah. so tell us the situation behind this one because it's sort of spectacular visually but, but perplexing yeah. at the same time yeah it's it's um it's one of the the type of conditions that I'm always looking for on Loch Ness. So it doesn't, it only ever happens, well, mostly in the winter, if this happens and you've, where you've got the steam rising from the loch, basically, which is just incredible. We've, all, we've also got, we've not only just got the steam rising, we've also got low cloud as well. So that's what's creating that effect. This is nothing um, spectacular that's been done in, in camera, actually. It's not, it's not even a long exposure. It's just, it's just a, sh it's a shot as it was. So, um, it's, this was more waiting for these conditions to happen. So it, it happens when the loch is warmer. Okay, get this the right way around. The loch is warmer than the than the air, so the water starts to evaporate up to it. It doesn't happen very often. It has to be really cold, <laughs> basically, because the loch is um, it's really cold in itself. So 
the air temperature's got to be below zero, I think it's usually when this sort of this starts to happen. So if I know that that's going to happen, I'll be out there with my camera in, the mo in early morning, you know, waiting for it. And we'll, you've also got to have low, low, um, low wind as well. So it's just not being blown away. So it was just one of those mornings that was absolutely Baltic <laughs> and um, absolutely stunning as well. And it just, it, it's, it's the feeling of being there and seeing this. It's just incredible. It, it just makes me, I can't, I was trying to think of a word for it. You know, when you're so exhilarated and you're in awe of, of looking at the landscape, you're just going, oh, wow, it's amazing. It's, it was one of those times that I have to think of a word for that. <laughs> <laughs> a little project for next week yeah, yeah i'll try and slip it in my uh, diction uh, yeah i mean and the, just the color the blues you know there's every there's a million blues in there yeah. as well and then just this the the bright you know shock uh, in a way through the through the frame but you know blue is, is such a good color from a from a calming and from a it is yeah. you know yeah. so you you mentioned you seek conditions do you seek color conditions as well I do mostly shoot blue images. <laughs> if you look at my Instagram, it's all blue. Um, and that's probably, it's just something that's happened. Um, and it, actually, that's, that's, it's a fairly good point, isn't it? I think that, that when you're not intentionally um, trying to find your style or your thing, it, it happens to you. Um, so that, it's one of those things that's really, really hard to understand. But when you stop, you stop thinking about how you... Um, how you want to shoot and you just you you let it happen and you stop looking looking at everybody else a little bit and and trying to find something that you really love it will come through eventually it takes a while um it takes a while to to hear that and to 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 find that um but for me it was definitely water and it was definitely blue and i was just i was just drawn to it and i found myself just creating images that were the word blues and it's all to do with the with the calmness to my because my images are all about calm as we've said so the the blue works for me quite well um so yeah it's just, it's just my thing I, I think and it's it's um it, it happens over and over uh, in my images so it's when you see that coming through naturally um, for, for no reason other than it's just coming through naturally that's that's when something authentic is is happening uh, i'm going to pick up a question that's and i may have yeah. to just only ask part of this just for time reasons as it's coming from Richard. Um, uh, he's talking about some locations that are uh, difficult to find versus iconic locations uh, that are really suffering with overuse. And the, okay. the crux of the question is, do you think Scotland has become a victim of its own success, so to speak? And uh, what do we think photographers and tour leaders, etc., can do to minimise damage or impact on the land? Um, I suppose there's certain places in Scotland that are, are struggling a little bit that um, they tend to you tend to not find me there. <laughs> so, you know, I think that we can what we can do is find other places. Scotland's huge. We have such a, a, a massive variety of beautiful areas that there's nobody and there's nobody there. So it, we you do tend to find people are clustered in the the hotspots. So I, I probably shouldn't name any. I don't think <laughs> I won't name any, um, but it, it's it's a bit of a shame because there's so much so much space in Scotland that all we need to do is go and find somewhere, you know, ten miles down the road, and you're completely alone, and you can then. But it, it comes back to that creating images of things we've seen. We often it's easy to see something on the internet and say, well, I'm going to go and photograph that, but I think you have to really think well. Um, why, why are you photographing that? What's the, what's the reason? And, and I don't think people question that enough. I think the why behind the image is, is really, really important. So I'm probably going off topic here a little bit, but I'll just, I'll just keep going. Yeah. So, I, you know, it, it comes back to that, um, taking people to places that are lesser, lesser known, I suppose, which is, um, I, do you know, just, just one place I'll mention is, you know, sky, for instance, in the, in the summer months, um, certainly in June, July, August, you can get completely blocked in on the roads now because it's it's just total carnage and it's, you know people are just it, it, it's crazy. Yet you could drive five minutes down the road or even walk five minutes down the road and be completely alone in a wilderness. So um, I think we just need to be thinking about taking people to new places a little bit maybe, and and. Um, 
bringing forth the idea that actually photographing places that aren't well known is, is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well said and a, a hot topic and a big topic. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, there is plenty of space. And maybe perhaps in this, in this lockdown period, people have the, the whole thing about work, you know, doing your own area, obviously, of course, but mm. that great images can be made anywhere. Hopefully yes. that's something you and I yeah. both definitely believe in. And so yeah. that's something we can carry on with. Um, I'm just flicking through a couple of yeah, the fine. Loch yeah. Ness ones here. Uh, and we can see, you know, that, that conditions can change, excuse me, get my teeth yeah. in, uh, quite radically. And actually, I would imagine, uh, and I, forgive my uh, poor knowledge of Loch Ness, it's not an area I know well, which is why you're here. Um, it's a huge space, right? So there must yeah. be lots of different vantage points. It's and, and absolutely, it's one of the, the, I can't remember the statistics, of one of the biggest lochs anyway in, in Scotland. And um, it's also one of the least photographed, so until I got here, <laughs> I photographed it a lot. Um, but you see, I live, I live literally um, five minutes down the road from the loch. So in, in fact, where we'll be staying in Loch Ness is just next to my house. <laughs> there's, a, there's a handy little inn just up the road from my house. So it's just, just absolutely beautiful. And it really isn't photographed that much because it's quite actually quite hard to access. Um, so there are access points, but you have to know, what, you have to know exactly what, where you're going and how to approach them so it's not the easiest it's quite a tricky lot to photograph if you don't know it but it, it, you know it's massive in terms of, of area around it and the, there are lots of places um to go this is one particular one actually which is it's a beautiful um viewpoint because you just look straight down to loch it's actually covered with um low cloud there but you can say you can see right down the middle of the loch and i often i'm often down there it's just it's just so peaceful yeah I think um, the great thing about the larger bodies of water as well like this with different access points is really throughout the course of a day or even probably in a morning, two or three hours, you're probably going to get lots of different, yeah. you know, feels, lots of different atmos. So th yeah. there's ample uh, opportunity to shoot. Yeah. And I suppose sometimes we do rush, don't we? But it's, and I, that's actually a question. Do you often, how, you know, if you go out of a morning like this, just yeah. as an example, yeah. you know, are you a sort of take three or four or take 50 or 60 sort of a pictures person? Depends on the it depends on the conditions and my excitement levels, I suppose, and my my vibe of the morning. Um, I'll probably stay in, if I have a I have an amazing like light like this. I'll probably stay in that one location for the whole morning, and um, just wait. You know, I think uh, as you said, the, the conditions change quite quickly on Loch Ness, so um, it's a matter of a lot of a lot of it's a matter of waiting. So yeah, I mean, I take a, an average number of photographs, I think, um, but I'll probably probably have one really successful image from a, from a morning and, and if I do that that's fine you know it's, uh, so I suppose with that point uh, and I only ask it because I, I your friend of mine Mr Sanders Paul yeah. who, who will be on it uh, we'll talk about that later but you know uh, he may just wait and pop his camera away and not do anything but yeah. if sometimes people need to work a scene a little because they're sort of connecting to it through the visual but then how do you how do you pick out this one from that session what is it about it is it because it's closest to representing your feeling at the time or is, is it other or other considerations in your selection process i think it's always for me it's always about exactly that but closest to how i was feeling at that point in time i think i don't ever i don't ever shoot or produce images for anyone else and i don't think i ever really have um, which has been the key to me finding that real um authentic style i think you know i think I, when i first started photographing landscapes um i never I, I didn't have any um i didn't have any vision of doing it for for anyone else or for for work particularly i wanted to but i didn't think i would ever be able to do that so um i was just shooting myself for myself and it and so basically when i yeah whenever i'm out it's it's always it's always for me and it's always about the feeling so yeah, it's, I mean, sometimes when it's, you know, if it's sunny like this or, or I'm waiting for conditions, I know this sounds weird, but I'll, I, I swim, <laughs> I sometimes swim in the lock. So, you know, it's, we're, talking, we're talking absorption into, into the yeah. landscape here. You're, you're very committed. <laughs> yeah, um, and it, it's about that experience. It's totally about the experience. And sometimes I will just sit at the, at the edge of the water and just, and just wait and, and feel that, um, that the feeling that you get 
um, that that makes you want to capture it on camera. Yeah, fab. I'm I'm happy we can talk about some of these things because oh, I'm sorry, jumping us around there. Uh, oh, we don't want to show you that just week. yet. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, you a little sneak peek there, everyone. Um, because I think this whole thing that photography is about more than just the image taking, and and sometimes why people um, come on trips and or go out of their own of the weekend is we know it's yeah. not just about the image; it's about that feeling. It's yeah. about what photography can bring you. And if you do get a chance to go on a trip, it, imagine just having five days. You can forget the rest of the world. You can just completely absorb yourself in in imagery, and that's that's a big thing. Yeah, and you know, on that point, I think um, I think that's a really good point because I think to, all too often we we do this thing where we think that taking time out to be creative and and to have time in nature is a luxury, don't we? Yeah, I, mean, I, I was always guilty of that, and then probably about ten years ago, I just decided to change that attitude to life because I was needing to do um, a bit of self-care because I wasn't doing so well in life and uh, I was I was struggling with stress and for, because I've been through that process I suddenly kind of turned around and I, I realized that I needed to start looking after myself I'd stopped photographing for a good sort of 10 years of my life I just kind of lost myself a little bit and um, I, I sort of woke up and went hang on a minute I've got to do this because um, self-care is when I, I'm not talking about like face masks or anything I'm talking about self-care as being doing the things taking time to do the things that make you feel um, happy and make you feel fulfilled and creativity does that creativity fulfills us and and you know we really need to um, we need to practice the things that make us feel happy alive and you know that feeds your soul kind of thing and I think that we we need to realize that it isn't a luxury and it's it's an important thing to do. And you can only go back and be happy with your family or look after your family if you're fulfilled and you're also well. And landscape photography for me is, is about wellness, definitely. It's definitely about wellness because one, you're out in nature and two, you're, you're feeling alive and you're feeling happy. And I really want to, to bring that to other people and to make them realize that they they should take lots of trips <laughs> but you know it's it's more than that it's a genuine thing i think if, if it if it makes you feel happy and fulfilled then go out and take that time for yourself it's really really important yeah you've got to you got to craft that time out sometimes it can yeah, be difficult to find but it's it is yeah. very important yeah it is yeah yeah so we just, um, as we sort of, thank you very much everyone for joining us, by the way. It's really cool you guys are all still with us. We've got a couple of images left uh, to talk about. So do stick with us for another 10 minutes or so. And if there's any other questions, there is a query, Margaret, which I'll just give you very quickly about uh, there's the, the gear question. Um, and sorry, I do joke, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's okay. important. It's and people, yeah. It's important for people to know sometimes. So uh, just a question about... Um, using filters with landscapes and mirrorless versus DSLR so maybe just give us a quick glimpse into what you might be taking out on a shoot of a morning sure so it's actually changed quite dramatically recently so I, I, I shot with Nikons for many many years and um, so I would be shooting with a D800 and probably a 2470 and a 7200 lens so it gives you the, the, the two options. And I, I often shoot with um, leaf filters, so a little stopper filters. So just to slow that shutter, shutter down a little bit, but not too much, you know. Um, so yeah, and obviously tripods. And uh, so yeah, I, I've done that for years. And then I, I discovered uh, a Fuji <laughs> X-T2 a, a few years ago and realized oh this is a, a beautiful little camera and so recently i i switched over to uh, gfx 50s now so everything's changing at the moment and i'm just exploring the lenses that i'm going to be shooting with but basically i shoot long quite a lot so I, i'm often I'm, I'm not such a um a wide wide angle shooter in fact most of the Image. I'm just trying to think back to the images today. I think most of them would have been with a long lens of some description. Um, 
yeah so i've at the moment i've got a, a, a 50s and a 250 mil lens because that was my one lens of choice at the minute so uh, well, expensive <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on from that yeah oh, no no actually i did get the 23 as well because i i do like doing night photography as well so i, okay. I do a bit of astro so it's fantastic for astro so that's the only time i'll put a wider lens on so yeah because i would imagine often in the locks and at the shoreline as you often are especially in the locks area you, you do generally need something fairly long on there because especially in big spaces it could, i mean again it depends on your vibe and your vision but it does it does yeah but even on the on the coast um i'll sh mostly be on a, a long lens and probably quite close in and maybe more abstract with my, my coastal images and my water images tend to be a bit more abstract a bit more um less traditional in in this is quite a traditional image that we're seeing here um but that was shot on a, actually a long lens it gives you that lovely compression so um yeah does that answer that question yeah, yeah i think definitely <laughs> absolutely no 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 thank you and it's interesting because i know i know um you know sometimes the gear thing can be scoffed at but actually sometimes yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It, you've got it you've got to work with it to the point where you're not yes. thinking about it but That's then right. it lets you be creative and, and yes. so it's finding your system to do that um, absolutely yeah yeah so i'm going to just move as quickly there's another question i'm going to come to we wanted to just show these two images because they're quite different mm -hmm. but actually the viewpoint is very similar here margaret mm -hmm. is that right yes yeah not far yeah Okay, yeah. so um, just different different conditions. So you know, the lo it does change very rapidly. This actually, this this image is it's quite funny because this is shot from it's a lay by actually, and it's it's on it's on the route home from the shops for me. So, <laughs> it's not a bad so, route home from the shops, is it? Come on. Out, not, <laughs> oh, I just need so, to nip out. Yeah. <laughs> So I often stop with that, you know, so you can see it as, you're, as I'm driving home, you can see the light changing and sometimes in the winter, it's always, it's always sort of in the uh, autumn, winter, you know, spring months, you see these, these dramatic skies that are coming over. This is Orchid Castle. And the first test would to be able to to pronounce <laughs> Orchid <laughs> Castle. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the, the conditions change quite rapidly. You know, that, that would have changed within five minutes. You know, you have to be, you have to be there at that, that time. Um, but it's it's quite um it's again it's a long lens just because of the distance involved in that as well so i mean it's and actually um i'm gonna actually i'm gonna pick up on the question so thank you because uh, uh, me throwing all these questions at you guys are out there you're watching so i want to hit them <laughs> for you so karen karen question here is great point margaret re fear of failure uh, sometimes i feel i fail too often and it hits yeah. my motivation so how do you motivate yeah. yourself when times are tough photographically tough what one would imagine <laughs> i think it's just it, it's remembering that we all fail and you know failure is just if you think of failure as just a little bit further down the road to to being successful <laughs> if you think of it like that you know i failed a million times in my life <laughs> at various things um but it, it's that picking yourself up and going oh well do you know what i've learned from that and you know you fail at, at the images each each image that you fail at you you're actually progressing you know you just you just if you learn from it and you just move on to the next one you just just keep to keep going so it's quite a hard thing to do and um, i think we just need to stop being so um self-critical of ourselves sometimes and stop listening to those voices inside our inside our heads that tell us that we're, we're, we're failures and um and if you can turn that round and go well you just just keep going it's just it's part of the it's part of the path, you know, and I think you've got to remember that every person that you think, what you see and you go, oh, they're successful. Um, just, just think of them 20 years ago, they were all making work that wasn't absolutely fabulous. We all have to start somewhere. So um, please don't let that stop you. I think, you know, just, just keep going. Yeah, don't forget, you only ever see what they want you to see. That's always the thing to remember. There's plenty of bad images on our That's memory cards. <laughs> <laughs> they're work in progress. That's yes, what, yeah. you know. <laughs> Uh, no, no, good, good. I wanted to just pick up on one thing before we sort of rally to a finish here. And thank you, Margaret, for your time as well. I love chatting with you because I think a lot of our <laughs> principles nice. are very similar. Yeah. Um, this this um, is more of a, a, a wow shot because of this yeah. drama. Yeah. And, and so I suppose even if you have sort of um, thoughts and principles around being uh, involved in calm and collection, yeah. And yeah. there are times, aren't there, when just... Yeah everything happens in front of you and it's still a thrill presumably to, to make those images. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I think that's, it's one of the things about my work that's quite unusual in that a lot of the, the calm in my supposedly calm images that I'm taking are actually at times when there's kind of crazy weather going on. So I'm, 
pretty much always shoot in the winter. Um, if it's a, the coastal areas, it tends to be wild, you know, wild conditions, big waves, um, dramatic skies, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a contradiction, actually. I'm looking for the calm, but I'm looking for the calm in the storm. So it, it's quite an interesting thing. And I think once you start to look at that, that sort of... Um, that sort of thing and how you can make that work and it, it does seem to work somehow to me that's that's it's fairly dramatic but to me it's calm <laughs> maybe yeah, it's I, just me <laughs> no no i think well and we all bring our own yeah. um baggage is the wrong word but we all bring our own yeah. thoughts to images yeah. you, you have mm -hmm. a different connection having been there and taken it and others yeah. will come in it but maybe you know calmness ne doesn't necessarily relate strictly to weather does it it can be space yeah. it can be yes. color yeah yeah it can be organization right. of shape yeah. you know and and, and actually, me, it's just, sorry, it's just the space and the, the 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 emptiness and the peacefulness because there's there's nobody there, and and for me that's that's what calm is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and if anyone hasn't, we we've not shown uh, Margaret's coastal work here because obviously this is a conversation about the locks, and we wanted to focus in on that. But do have a look at her website because she's got wonderful images of, of the coastal areas in Scotland as well, and. Um, some of that calm in the storm uh, yeah. you can definitely see in those images some behind me there yeah yeah <laughs> i can oh, you should have a price tag on that margaret yeah, sure. uh, um but i will i will bring us towards a close here um but thank you again very much everyone for sticking with us so margaret i suppose a lot of the things we've touched and there's a little preview for next week but i'll get to that in a second a lot of the things we've touched on have been about sort of connection and about calmness and about just starting to imbibe the atmosphere around you and, and you've said that yeah. will often lead itself to your own sort of style emerging yeah. are there any just final thoughts to, to give people that inspiration to go away and, and explore if they've enjoyed our sorts of conversations tonight final thoughts yeah i suppose that the big thing for me is that i um i i feel really strongly about um inspiring and uplifting other people so um i really really you know there's that there's that there's a phrase called a rising tide raises ships i don't know if you've heard it but basically we all need to sort of come up we all we all come up together so i really feel strongly about people just being inspired and going out and shooting and you know the world we need more art we need more creativity in this world we need more beauty and we need more imagery so i would just say to, to everybody to, to just to just please get out there and just shoot because uh, you know it's 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 valuable and you've all got something to share we're all unique and we've all got a unique take on things so um all all of your work your work's valid and um if we can all just rise up a little bit that'd be fantastic more photography in the world fab yeah excellent sentiments and uh yeah. i very much enjoyed chatting with you Thank two you south manchester peeps together <laughs> <laughs> um I, i'm just going to do a little plug for next week obviously it's, uh these are continuing uh, for the foreseeable future for a number of weeks we have a lot of them planned out now and uh, next week i shall be back with paul sanders my my friend and margaret's friend <laughs> uh, and adrian beasley also our friend uh, to talk about their trip to new york and really actually we're going to focus quite a lot on uh, architecture shooting in cities black and white and kind of capturing some of that vibe of new york and that's a lot of the things we've talked about here is um you know connecting to places and, and then mastering that with your image making as well so uh, if there are any other questions i'll try and get to those now but lots of uh, comments coming in thanking you margaret so that's fab as well uh, but we will be back next week 8 p.m tuesday here on the facebook feed and in the meantime if you check out the light and land website for all the upcoming tours and events and of course check out margaret's uh, website as well but for us i'm going to end the video in three two one and good night from both of us we'll see you again soon